Right, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor to present my talk here, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I feel like my talks and I are both outliers in the early morning. Uh, so I'm not a uh, professor Arakawa student. I'm, instead, I'm Arakawa's student to Professor Steve Kruger, a PhD student. So uh, actually, I just graduated uh, with my PhD from University of Utah this summer. And I will officially start my post uh, later this week at Princeton University. So I feel like it's a great way, it's a great honor to begin with uh, this uh, symposium where we, in honor of Professor Arakawa. So the work I'm going to present today is part of my PhD program, and where I work with Steve Kruger as a making course on GMAs. And uh, so as a title here, we're interested in to look at the impacts of CS needs on low level cult. Uh, especially in the wintertime Arctic. So I bet that most of you would be more familiar with cows than CS needs. Uh, that's why I want to start my talk by showing you this map of polar ice cap. And I've seen this similar image at many times at many locations. Uh, it seems to me that the polar ice cap of the Arctic is a featureless slab with a very smooth surface. So this is a little bit misleading because it's not telling you the whole story. Uh, instead, the Arctic should be, the Arctic polar ice cap should be something look like this, sorry. Uh, so the polar ice cap is actually divided into many individual ice flows. Uh, by those quasi-linear openings with relatively dark color, and those openings are what we call CS leads. So in words by definition, the leads are those non-narrow channels of both open water as well as thin ice, and usually they have uh, several meters to tens of kilometers width and hundreds to 100, 100 meters to 100 kilometers in length. So, uh, that is uh, the, the one I just showed is uh, from a very high resolution GCM, uh, one kilometer. And we do observe something quite similar in reality. And this is what you can see from space uh, in a region that's off the coast of Alaska. And we see in this snapshot of the real world, it's much more complicated where we have uh, much more small and narrow CS needs and some large needs, for example, this one I zoomed in here. Oh, uh, some <laughs> I got some issue. But anyway, you can tell this quite a large issue, a uh, large lead over here with a lead width that's uh, up to 20 kilometers in width. All right, so if you want to take a closer look at it, this is a very nice example uh, where we see, uh, so this picture was taken from a recent uh, Arctic campaign called Mosaic, and we see a lead formed in the uh, ice camp site and separated those instruments that scientists put on the sea ice. And it, it looks like a pretty similar, a pretty small lead, uh, unless you need to get across it. So uh, those openings of the need really add extra work for the scientists doing the field campaign, especially in the winter time. And another point I want to make here is the Arctic is a really cloudy place throughout the year. As you can probably tell from these two photos, both in May and September. So motivated by those, uh, one the, so the CS needs are very important in many uh, different aspects. Uh, both for the atmospheric scientists as well as uh, the oceanographer. Uh, but here I'm only both, uh, focusing on two major impacts that are really uh, re relevant to my work. The first one is the enhanced surface fluxes of both heat and moisture. And this is uh, from the fact that in the winter time, once the need open, uh, it exposes the relatively warm water with a freezing temperature maybe minus 1.8 Celsius degrees to the cold atmosphere and it will result in a large air sea temperature contrast that is up to 40 Celsius degrees in the winter time. 
So it is also well, quite well known in the field that the fluxes, uh, turbulent fluxes over the lead are two orders of magnitude larger than that over the thick ice. So in winter time, on average, lead error coverage is about several percent, uh, but even one percent of CS lead coverage can contribute equally to the rest of the 99 percent of thick ice in terms of the heat exchange, for example. Uh, so definitely their impact is not proportional to their need coverage. And the second one is their potential to affect the boundary layer clouds. So here in this uh, simple schematic I show here, and once the need opens, they create a convective internal boundary layer. And those turbulence transporting both heat and moisture, they have a potential to affect the overlying low low clouds in the boundary layer. Uh, but this part is not that well established in the field, and that is motivated our work here. And also, during the large background in the Arctic, we're expecting a thinner, younger, and more fractured Arctic sea ice, so more likely we will expect a more sea ice need. Uh, so a uh, very fundamental and key question we ask this, in this work is how do needs impact the low level cows, and why, if there is any. So in terms of the how question, and in this field, there's a simple but widely uh, assumed, uh, commonly used assumption that is more needs would result in more low-level clouds. Uh, but to the best of our knowledge, no studies have been conducted to examine this relationship, especially from the uh, observational perspective. So the initial task of our study amounts to examine this simple relationship, and it would go from a local scale study and then extend to a panarctic study. Uh, but here, I'm only gonna show the local scale study in the interest of time. Uh, so we choose to start with a region uh, that is off the coast of Alaska, uh, roughly within this red curve. And uh, a couple of reasons made the final decision here. Uh, a is, as we can see from this map, this region is quite close uh, to one of the hot, lead hot spots in the Beaufort Gear, uh, Beaufort Ocean. Uh, so we would expect to need to occur frequently in this region. And B is, uh, we have a very long record called observations at a land site called Barrier uh, from a ground-based uh, millimeter called radar. And also we have very nice uh, regular radio sound and surface environments at this land site as well. So that is uh, perfect. And with this data, uh, we uh, did our best and tried to control the meteorology. Uh, and here are some details. I think I'm gonna skip here. Instead, I will show you the main results. Um, so with our samples that we carefully selected, uh, we divided them into two groups, one with uh, fewer needs on your left and one with more needs on your right. And to look at the need cloud relationship, and we examined the corresponding clouds. Uh, what I show here is the vertical profile of the cloud occurrence uh, frequency, and also as a function of different radar reflectivity thresholds. So I want to draw your attention to those low level clouds only, uh, below two kilometer. And by comparing these two groups, I mean, you can see the group with the lower, uh, lower needs has abundant of low-level uh, low clouds, but the group with uh, more needs has less low-level clouds. So it's quite straightforward. The observations are telling us that the more needs are associated with uh, less low-level clouds. So if you can recall uh, the assumption that are widely used, that is uh, more needs are associated with more low-level clouds. So this is just the opposite to what people would expect. So we also uh, use a completely different uh, cloud observations to make the results more concrete. Here I'm using, um, uh, doing the similar analysis I'm showing in the upper uh, panel. And you see overall the pattern is quite similar and is telling us a relatively robust relationship. So this is the results from the par uh, local scale and the paritic results are supportive as well. And the next is the why question. And uh, so for this part, we use a 3D cloud resolving model, SAM, 
And this is a, a very simple schematic for our domain design where we have an atmosphere layer on top of the CS layer on top of the ocean. And to make it a more uh, simple as possible, we input needs in the domain uh, to simulate the CS need and uh, inhomogeneous surface. So uh, to make the long story short, uh, we conducted a, lot, uh, a set of simulations, but here I'm only selecting three of them. And the first one is our control one. We have an uh, open need, and the other two cases, uh, we double the need error uh, fraction, but we input in different types of need. Uh, there's two open need in the second, and uh, one open and one frozen in the third. So by inputting the frozen need, we're considering the life cycle of the need, and also by definition, the needs consist of both open and frozen. So here are the uh, uh, initial conditions, uh, soundings that we input uh, in our domain, and we select we uh, we simulated all the cases the first three hours. And right here, I'm showing is the first case uh, for the simulated cloud. As we can see, once the need opened, the calls are generated and then downstream uh, for uh, to about 15 kilometers. So I want to. <laughs> Yeah, do the in for the interest of time. Uh, maybe I want to just show quickly show you the k results. So here is at the sixth hour, and we can see from the open to the open open, the clouds are generated. Uh, more clouds are generated, and we can also tell from the time series of cloud coverage, almost four times of cloud coverage. Uh, but for the open frozen case, uh, it seems no clouds are observed downstream of the frozen lead, and the in the time series, we can tell it takes some time for the frozen lead to do the work before a drop of the uh, cloud coverage or observed. And by the end of the six hours, uh, we observed half of the cloud coverage compared with the open case. So the main reason for this, we argue, is because the surface fluxes over the frozen lead, which are shown in this dashed lines, especially the turbulent flux is sensible in orange and latent flux in purple, uh, the, com the unique combination of, the f uh, of the f those turbulent fluxes over the frozen lead that together, where we, where we have a lar relatively large sensible heat flux, but almost the completely surprise the latent heat flux that create together create a dry and convect environment and that are not favorable uh, to the cloud and uh, tend to dissipate the cloud. So last quickly, I uh, want to show you uh, what if we vary the ice thickness over the frozen need and what we get is the, the change, fractional change of the cloud, fraction, uh, cloud, distribute, cloud coverage uh, which are shown in this uh, black curve, we can see the CS need with uh, uh, ice thickness probably from 2.5 centimeter all the way to 30, km, 30 centimeter, and they can dissipate the low locals with various extents. Yeah, I guess that's the main story here. I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? David? Very cool. I wish I could have absorbed the um, LES simulations better. Um, but uh, I noticed in the observations, it seemed as if there was also more, there was more upper level clouds in the observations uh, during the high weight fraction times. Have you thought about that at all? Or is that an accident artifact of the analysis? Uh, yeah, so um, as I mentioned before, well, I actually, I don't have time to do this, but one of the key challenges for this observation analysis is to control the large scale meteorology, which could affect both the CS need and the clouds. So we, what we did is we selected our, our samples very carefully, uh, but the residual, uh, you can see the difference in the mid-level clouds with argue would be from the, you know, the diff slightly different large scale meteorology between these two groups. And I also did some uh, extra uh, additional analysis to say that the low level clouds is actually sort of independent from the mid level clouds in the Arctic. Uh, and also those low level clouds are those that are most affected by the CS need. 
uh, so they get the CSD had a hard time to affect the above mid-level clouds. So 